Hello there and welcome to Classic Golf Clubs. Today I thought we'd look at one of the smaller and lesser known brands and that's Sport Brook Golf Company Limited. We'll have a look at some of their clubs and then do a little bit of research into the background of the company as much as I can find out on them and then go out onto the course and play the clubs and see how they perform. Let's have a look at some woods first then. These are uh, a range that were running for quite a few years with um, Spark Rook Golf Company and it's the Cypress Point Long Flight Clubs and they're made from an ABS polymer uh, so they were very suitable for the British weather and they claim to have similar or even longer distance than wooden headed clubs. Um, as claimed by um, many amateurs and professionals, I think it's said in the adverts. Well, if we just have a look at the clubs in a bit more detail, we can see it's a very similar shape to a, a traditional persimmon or laminated wood. We've even, even got an insert in there uh, with three screws holding it in place. Um, whether there's any whipping under there or not, I'm not sure. But we've got a slight collar and a, a bit of a ferrule, uh, so a nice finish there. Um, just spin that round and we can see the long flight name uh, which was used quite a lot by uh, Spark Rook Golf Company and on the sole, I'll spin that round again, we can see uh, this is the three wood, uh, Cypress Point long flight, I'm not getting that in focus very well, is that any better? Yes there we go, Cypress Point long flight and uh, the, the number three and we've got a brass sole plate on there as well and if we look at the driver that would be aluminium I think I've got here a 3, 4 and a 5 uh, 3, 4 and the 1 wood just have a spin around with this one yep, so there we've got the 4 and we can see in the bottom there uh, a wooden plug um, which was traditional with wooden clubs to stop dirt getting into the bottom so they're still using a wooden plug I guess that was just an easier thing to shape uh, and fit to the club than making it out of plastic again so I'll put that one back there, and that one back there, spin that around, and I've got here, just have a very quick look at this, this is an advert from Golf Monthly, June 1966, and we can see there, Cypress Point Long Flight Clubs, add distance to your drives, um, typical uh, advertising speak. And this looks very similar to the clubs I've got in front of us, only it doesn't have uh, the screws in the face. Um, there were several variations on these, as I'll, I'll talk about later on when I look in more detail uh, at Sparkbrook. And that's a quick look at an advert from the time. Um, a quick look at the shafts, as we normally do. Um, this one is a True Temper Pro Fit shaft, so that dates it pretty well to the, the 1960s. And I've re-gripped these just recently. Uh, the old grips were in terrible condition. I'll just uh, find one of the old grips for you. And there's the, the end cap in focus. You can't quite make that out very easily, but it says Avon Cobra. I think the camera's doing its best to hold the, uh, the writing steady, which is making it a little bit blurred. Uh, looking down the, the rest of the grip, we can see the Cobra name on there at the bottom of the grip as well. So very uh, poor grips and I've just taken them off in the normal way and I've put on, um, I mean this might look a little out of place uh, but it's a red grip and red grips were used um, and I've taken a few really old red grips off clubs so let me just find one of those for you just to show that, prove that red grips were available at the time. Right, so here's a, a, a period red grip, it's an Avon Victory grip. Um, the red ones aren't quite as bad as the, the grip Victory Green, I find. This one was actually a, a reminder grip, and if I can turn that round properly, get all the pieces together, we can see a thicker section there, which would enable the golfer to feel the, uh, the, the club was held in the right orientation. So that's the woods covered then. Here are the irons I'm going to be using today. Uh, Spark Brook uh, Cypress Point again, uh, USA model. So let's have a look at one of these in a bit more detail. You can see on the head there, it's got Sparko product. 
Um, I presume that's a, <coughs> a, a, a made up from the name Sparkbrook Golf Company, uh, shortened to Sparko, uh, USA model. And again, we've got that Cypress Point script that we saw earlier. The face of the club, fairly straightforward, lined face, um, lines boxing the grooves in, and a slight frosting there as well. And the ferrule, attractive ferrule, same colours as we saw on the uh, long flight woods, red, uh, orange, red. Whether that was Sparkbrook's regular colouring that they used on their ferrules, I'm not 100% sure, but it's certainly uh, the ones that have been used on this model, which dates from 1961. I'll show an advert for that later on uh, when we look in more detail at the Sparkbrook company. Um, Wingback design, one of my favourites. Um, not sure what else I can say about this really. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's forged or cast. Uh, there were many engineering shops in the Birmingham area at this time. Birmingham was a, a hub of industry for the UK up until the 80s or 90s when sadly a lot of that industry uh, was, was failing and there's very little of it left now. So that's the irons. And here's the putter I've chosen today. Uh, keeping with the um, man-made uh, heads as per the ABS uh, long flight woods, I've gone for a Gowers, Gowers Brown um, nylon headed club. Uh, it's not one of my favourites to use, I've got to be honest. Um, in fact, it's a little bit clunky in appearance and feel and sound. The shaft, uh, if we can hold that there, as we can see, it's got a bit of a, a bend in it. That's deliberate and it's to uh, align the club head up uh, to give a uh, to keep the face in line with the shaft. Um, if we have a look at the sole of the club, and we can see Gowers Brown, Nylon and the model Lifesaver, patent pending. It's a very weighty head. I don't think there's any metal weight in there. It's just the, the sheer volume of the nylon. Uh, so it would, you would think that it would feel uh, nice on the on the putting green, but my experience of it is that that's not the case. Uh, the ball feels quite uh, dead off the face. Um, there we go. I've not given it a very good review. Uh, let's hope it performs better on the golf course. But before I play the clubs, a little bit of information about Sparkbrook Golf Ball Company Limited. I've not been able to find a definite date for when they uh, began business, but it would appear to be sometime in the 1920s. They were primarily ball manufacturers with a number of ranges. The catalogue we're looking at here, I'm not sure of the exact date, but I would expect it to be late 1930s or possibly 1940s. This is a golf ball catalogue and it also has a few accessories, as we can see here. Items such as practice balls with parachutes. It was even possible to have the old balls recovered and repainted. Here are a few examples of boxes of golf balls produced by Sparkbrook Company. The name Sparkbrook, incidentally, comes from the area where the company was based, which was just to the southeast of central Birmingham. And here are two balls to actually look at a foursome and a blue spot. We've just seen uh, the, the examples of these in the photographs, uh, box sets. Uh, nice to have a look at an actual ball. The foursome, number four. Uh, rather than the number being placed above or below, as is the the, the tradition these days, uh, is we can see that the four is placed uh, around the ball. And the same with the blue spot, we can see the three there, and we've also got it three, three, and three, although that's uh, the paint has been lost on this example. Uh, both balls are the 1.62 inch, rather than the uh, larger size that we play today. And I don't think these will be worth taking out onto the course. They've been at the bottom of somebody's bag for quite a few years. And uh, I would expect that the covers on these would crack very quickly. Certainly on this for someone. Uh, possibly not on the blue spot, which is in a little bit better condition. Um, but I'm not going to attempt to play either of these balls. They're just nice ones to have as an example. Oh, rather than just the pictures, we've actually got the balls there. 
Well, that covers the golf balls, but we're really interested in clubs here. This catalogue is a similar date to the golf ball catalogue we've just looked at. Here's a club model that was available, the blue spot uh, with woods. We've then got the low score brand, which does crop up now and again, um, and usually in singles. I'm not sure whether Sportbook actually made these or whether they factored them out to somebody such as Spalding. Um, we've then got uh, a couple more examples here, model arrow and ring brand. I previously said I was unsure of the date for these two catalogues, but I've just noticed that they include purchase tax, which gives us a bit of a clue. Introduced in 1940 at 33 and a third, it gradually went up through the war before dropping again to 33 and a third. I very much doubt golf catalogues would have been printed during the early war years, so my guess is that this was produced after April 1946, at a time when, as I previously mentioned, pre-war designs were still very much in evidence and new clubs hadn't yet been introduced. This advert from 1961 shows on the left the USA model Cypress Point as featured in this uh, video. We've now got a selection of adverts for Cypress Point polymer headed woods uh, which ran for quite a few years in the mid to late 1960s, a very popular model. A quick look at the few iron heads I've seen, starting with this fuzzy image of the blue spot followed by a slightly better image of the low score model, both of these were dot faced clubs. Then we've got the USA model Cypress Point as featured in the video and finally the long flight although I haven't seen an actual example of this club, just the uh, pictures in adverts. Exactly when Sparkbrook stopped trading, I'm not sure, but this article appeared in Golf Greenkeeping and Course Maintenance magazine for February 1985. One final point of interest is shown on the box for these long flight balls. If we look closely, we can see that the, chain, the name has changed to Spark Brook and the address is now Grantham in Lincolnshire rather than uh, Spark Brook in Birmingham. So this was probably one of the last balls produced, I would think, by Spark Brook. OK, that's enough chatter. Time to get the, the clubs out on the course now. As usual, I've produced the lofts for the clubs uh, which is shown here uh, and it also shows the slight gap between the 8 and the pitching wedge although I think with the lofts that are there the set are perfectly usable. Hello again uh, classic golf enthusiasts uh, here for a, another spell on the golf course um, with a set of old clubs and as we've already seen I've got the uh, Sparkbrook clubs today just have a very quick look at the clubs in the bag. So there they are, it's another vintage bag. I'm not sure what make this one is. Might say around on the handle somewhere. No, that's all disappeared. And there's the clubs. Uh, the Cypress Point Long Flight ABS Woods. The Cypress Point USA Model Irons. I didn't say what sand iron I was going to be using in the review. And it's the trusty Slazinger Gary player from, I think, 1962. And there we've got the uh, nylon-headed Lifesaver putter. Let's hope it lives up to its name. Right, let's, uh, let's get things going. A decent tee shot to the middle of the green, leaving me about a 35 foot putt. After all the bad press I gave the uh, Gowers Brown Lifesaver, will it be able to uh, save the day here. Yes, a comfortable two put par. On to the next tee, and I've got the ABS polymer headed one wood. Quite like these woods actually, they're very similar size to a persimmon, and the feel isn't too different either. Just a pity that the shot was a, a bit of a, a, a fade to the right, and it finished in the bunker about 200 yards away bit thin out, hit the bank and into the second bunker. 
and you can see here two tracks leading to where my ball is. The first was made my, by my ball, but the second was made by the previous player who hadn't bothered to rake over the uh, divot that they'd left. So I just had to blast this out to the best of my ability and then have a bit of a strop as I raked up the, uh, the crater that I'd left. After three shots then, and I'm still 245 yards away, I'm just trying to lay up to a safe wedge distance with my six iron here. Reasonable shot, and it puts me just to the right and in wedge range. My normal horrible looking uh, wedge swing, but the flight uh, was a little bit lower than I intended but gets to the green within reasonable distance. Unfortunately I forgot to press record for the putting so you're um, not able to see the ensuing three put for a triple bogey eight. Back on the tee again and a nice uh, drive, a little bit low uh, but nice draw on it finishing just off the left side of the fairway. one of my better strikes of the day and I was quite surprised to see it had actually made the green. The lifesaver putter had obviously been a little, little bit upset with the uh, bad press I'd given it and exacted its revenge on the previous green but it looks like we're back on good terms again as I rolled this one up to uh, tapping distance and that was a, a nice par on this hole that I often get into trouble on. Back on the tee, a bit of a low uh, swipe at the ball, it gets a fair way up and into range of the green. And I'm using my forward into a little bit of a breeze. Decent strike, just pulled a little bit left. I was hoping this would have made the green but it just caught in the, uh, the fringe on the left side. So that left me a chip. As many viewers will know, my uh, the weak part of my game. This one wasn't too bad. Got me into uh, a possible chance of a par. Not to be though, but another uh, tap in with the lifesaver, and that's a, a bogey. So, the last hole of the five holes I'm doing here, par three again, and I'm hitting the seven iron. Not a bad strike, a little bit pulled to the left, it just got over the bunker and left me on the green. So another test for the lifesaver putter. Are we still on good terms? No, it didn't go in, but I think you can safely say that uh, everything's uh, ship shape and Bristol fashion again in our relationship. And that's another tap in par. In summary then, Three pars, one bogey, and one rather messy triple. So that gave me a four over par total. I didn't find any fairways off the tee, but I did hit three GRs, which I was very pleased with. And I had 11 puts in total. So not a total uh, disaster with the lifesaver. And I think it was more my bad putting than the fault of the putter. And that brings us to the end of the video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time.